What's going on, Dynasty Land? Welcome back That's to the channel. Started, Dynasty Land. Bunk bed breakdowns with your boy and Noah. The I don't I don't even know what to call Noah anymore, man. He, he he's evolved past Rafa hair. I don't know what type of hair is rocking these days, uh, but it's totally new, and you know it's, we're in unventured territory. But uh, they're gonna say and improved, but that was <laughs> left out. So now I'm a little self conscious to start. The video. <laughs> uh, yeah, Noah, how's it going, man? It's going all right. I mean, the little dig at my hair, we'll, we'll, we'll run through it like Javante Williams. School's starting real soon. By the time you're watching this, I'm already failing my classes. So that's going to not hamper the production of these videos. It's probably going to actually improve the production of these videos because I'm going to put off my schoolwork to improve the editing and stuff like that. So that should be fun. But it's still like 40 degrees here. The weather still stinks. So it's I could say I'm having a good time, but really I'm I'm not. <laughs> no no one's having a good time man still it's still fucking covid but we find solace in dynasty offseason during covid there's a lot to go over uh you know last last week no and i put out the first round of a mock draft uh super super early rookie 2021 rookie class super flex mock draft today we're gonna carry you into the money zone and you know the money zone for me this year really is that second round we're not gonna have the underwear olympics so, you know, the Underwear Olympics hype season sell cycle will be a little bit more wane. We're probably going to see 20 people report sub 4 to 40 times now that they're just running in their own basement on the treadmill. Um, so it's going to be exciting. I mean, it's going to be fun because, you know, the regular the regular process has to change. You know, you know, people usually do their film grinding, do their data grinding. And then like the combine comes, they take the combine, put it into their fancy model and then spit out an r squared and then they wait for the draft and they take the draft capital put in their model spit out a fa fancy r squared that's just all all going up in the you know you can take that and toss it out the window now because we have no combine the nfl has made it official uh, as some of us expected but you know you're gonna have to take a different approach to how you analyze athleticism right it's not going to be based on bench press and running around pylons it's going to be based on you know what you guys see on film you know, what we see, there's some cool data analytics tools out there that measure in-game speed. You know, how fast are these players running? Are they hitting 23 miles per hour, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's going to be a very different approach. And I think really, you know, like most years, second round is kind of where you make that money, right? Because that's when you that's when you make the correct decision. You either you're either a Keyshawn Vaughn drafter or you're a T Higgins drafter in the second round, right? So you got to make sure that you you fall in on the right side of history uh, to make sure you hit the biggest wins you can in those second rounds. So we're gonna try and guide you through our thoughts in the second round based on what we know today. Uh, now it's gonna evolve, it's gonna change, and I always mock mock drafts because. I think, you know, a lot of times they're a waste of time, but this will give you guys some insight into what we think about some of these players. You know, we'll talk a little bit of the talent. Probably won't dive too deep because, you know, Noah and I will do a bunch of like, well, similar to last year, we'll do like some deep dive videos where he'll break down the film. I'll break down the numbers. We'll do some cut-ups. We'll do some hot edits uh, and then uh, spit that out on the YouTube channel later on. So we'll just kind of go a quick overview. Uh, Noah, do you want to, should we run through, I guess, the first the first round first? Yes. Yeah, or, so or, or is there something else we got to do before that? Yeah, I was going to say, instead of the first round, I think we got to hit the intro. All right, so for the first round, we did it last week. If you didn't tune in, go tune in, but I'm going to save you about an hour and 15 minutes. We had 101, Trav forgot the guy's fucking name, Trevor Lawrence, and then from there we go Najee Harris. Justin Fields, Javante Williams, Jamar Chase, Travis Etienne, Trey Lance, Zach Wilson, Rashad Bateman, Devonta Smith, Kyle Pitts, Jalen Waddle, and Mike. I know you put up a video this past Monday going through your rankings. Are there any like big movers within that first round? I know you had Etienne jumping Javante. Would he move up to your 104 ahead of Chase for you, or would both running backs fall behind Chase? Uh, I mean, it, it's going to depend there, I guess, on my team. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna flip back and forth. Like right now. I kind of have it Jamar Chase uh, up front, but you know, just depending on where they go and where they land, that could that's a very fluid group right there between Najee, Jamar, Travis, Etienne, and Javante Williams. And honestly, even fluid, including Trey Lance and Zach Wilson, because we kind of talked about last week where they could land really depend really can impact a lot of things. All right, for sure. And then we'll kick off round two with a guy who barely missed round one. I think Mike and I 
both had him in our top 12, but because we had other guys, I'm not sure how the math worked out. He didn't end up being in our top 12. <laughs> we got Rondell Moore. Not going to go too in-depth on him because we did cover him a little bit last week. He broke out as a freshman, gets hurt his second year, comes back. He's got David Bell to produce on the other side of him, still goes out and produces. The fact that he came back after a long absence showed what we like to see out of him, the athleticism, the fact that he's like 5'9 and like 200,000 pounds. He's built like an absolute unit. He's like a modern day Steve Smith. And I think a more modern comparison in terms of not just size, because this guy's bigger than Debo Samuel, but I think the way that he's gonna be used a lot behind the line of scrimmage, like this year, Debo Samuel had like negative seven air yards, but like 600 receiving yards total. Cause he's so good after the catch. I think Rondell Moore in the NFL, obviously he's not going to land with a guy like Kyle Shanahan, but first round capital, second round capital. I think whoever's going to take him, will know how to use him. And in that role will be somebody that's being used, not out of the backfield as a running back, but behind the line of scrimmage in the screen game, short over the middle intermediate type of routes to be used after the catch because he breaks a whole lot of tackles. He is, you know, he's like a little fucking jukebox in the open field. He just runs everybody over. He runs through people. He runs around people. And although he might be like a little bit shorter and although he's not like an expansive route tree type of guy, I think what he's good at, he's elite at. And because of that, you know, the NFL is moving more towards yak guys. I think he fits towards what the NFL is moving towards now. And he can be a perfectly fine wide receiver two in an offense. And because of that, become like a fantasy wide receiver two that doesn't need 100 receptions to turn in that type of performance. Can be a guy who gets like 60 receptions for a thousand yards and a handful of touchdowns. And with his skill set, like he doesn't need, as I said, like he doesn't need a whole lot of touches to be able to produce extremely heavily. So for me, he's my 201. And I think both of us would be well Com- pretty comfortable taking him in the first round. Yeah, I mean, Rondell Moore, he, he has an elite, elite analytical profile. He broke out at the tender age of 18.2, and he didn't just break out in the traditional sense where people use like a 20% dominant. He broke out in a big way. He stepped on the field and immediately achieved a 30% dominator, which is really hard to do in this class. There's only three people that did that. Rondell Moore, Rashad Bateman, who we already took in the prior round, and an uh, unknown guy to me who I'm looking into more so now is, is Jaden Reed. But the two most the two guys you really want to care about that are probably going to get more of the draft capitals are Rashad Bateman and Rondell Moore. So elite breakout profile, you know, he kind of fell down people's ranks as he got hurt uh, in his second year. He was well on his way to just absolutely blowing it up, up again in his second year. But, you know, getting hurt kind of like dinged them there a little bit. But uh, don't forget about Rondell Moore. He also won the Paul Hornung Award, which is like given to the nation's most versatile player. You know, prior winners of that include uh, Odell Beckham. Um, so, you know, good, good players, good, good, good company to be in. Good profile, elite profile. You know, the only reason why he's slipped a little bit in my rankings, I've been hearing more, uh, you know, from the in- NFL insiders, you know, guys like Lance Zerline, that like he might not get like high end draft capital. So that's the only reason why he's moved down a little bit in my ranks. But like if he goes in the first round, uh, he's going to be a top target of mine going forward. I can't uh, wait for Kyle Shanahan to go from drafting Pettis, replacing him with Debo, replacing Debo with Brandon Ayuk, and then replacing Brandon Ayuk with Rondell Moore. It would just be like the perfect thing. And then you got to sell him after year one because then we know Kyle Shanahan's going to draft some bum in 2022 <laughs> that's going to outproduce him. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I'll follow up that pick there with my guy who I've been just pounding the table for nonstop. And that's Yami Brown. He plays for UNC, catches passes from Sam Howell, one of the top QB prospects of the 2022 class. You know, he's not a, he's not a true freshman breakout, but he broke out. When he broke out, he broke out huge as well. Similar to Rondell, you know, instead of just going for that simple 20% dominator breakout, he immediately jumped into the 30% tier and maintained that throughout his junior season. Uh, he had 30% of market share of receiving yards in, when he was 19 years old and then 34% in the most latest junior season. He is absolutely an alpha dog. And, you know, what I like about him is not just the numbers, but when you look at him, I mean, he's a burner, man. He is a downfield threat. And we can see, like, that's that's kind of where, you know, the NFL, like, wants to go. You know, people are trying to catch up with what the Chiefs are building on offense. And I just think he would fit so perfectly as, like, a wide receiver, too, on a lot of teams, right? You know, he he's kind of like that, you know, I think Fusu uh, put out this comp, and I absolutely loved it. But it, he's kind of like Will Fuller. And... You know, you drop him in on a Green Bay, right? You drop him in on Chiefs, who only have Tyreek Hill signed right now, so that I could easily, easily see them taking a wide receiver in this very deep class. They can grab Deami Brown in the late second, maybe early third round, and he would become what McCole Hardman never could. 
So I really, really love Deion Brown. That was a real like ricochet shot of McCall Harvin. <laughs> I really like Deami Brown, and I think, you know, I'm interested to see where you come out on the film side of him, but he's an absolute, absolute baller to me. And I think, you know, having lost Justin Ross from this class early on, I think Deami Brown really stepped in and, and filled those shoes because this guy is a deep down the field threat, and he's, he's got some arrogant hands too, man. He makes some pretty baller ass catches. Yeah, he does have arrogant hands. I was actually looking into the numbers, and I think he has like 16 drops over these past two years on like 132 catchable targets, which isn't great. But at the same time, like he's made – I know it's a cop-out to say always made this far in his career. He's going to be like a first or second round pick in the NFL draft. His hands are fine. We see guys plenty of times drop a ton of passes. Hopefully that's something he can clean up. That is just like one knock that people have on him. But beyond that, right, like he's somebody who I really think could run high 4-3s, like 4-3-8, 4-3-9, or low 4-4s, type of 40 time. You brought up the Will Fuller comparison. I think Will Fuller's a little bit different in the sense that like this year it looked like he put on some weight and looked like a true number one receiver. I'm not so sure Brown is going to be able to do that at the next level. But what he does remind me of, of no relation, is a guy like John Brown, who is, you know, a little bit slighter of a frame, can work over the middle, but that's not necessarily where he makes his bread. It's more so in like the double move of the deep plays and just a really good overall receiver when it comes down to being a deep threat if you went to the bills and replaced a john brown in an offense that wants to throw as much as they do with brian dable likely coming back and you know brown getting older and then diami brown coming in and taking over the reins i would love him to play opposite with stefan diggs and just stretch the field there but um, i do have him a little bit lower than where you have him but it's to me pretty landing spot dependent. If he does land in a Green Bay, if he does land in a Buffalo Bill type of situation, he could easily rise up my boards because, as you said, he has the analytical profile and he has the skill set and the athleticism um, that is required to turn in good fantasy production. Another guy who doesn't need 100 receptions a year to be able to be, you know, wide receiver two, wide receiver three type of guy. And in the second round, if you can get a wide receiver three year after year, it might sound like that's a bust type of a pick, but how many chances are you going to get at that? Like the eighth wide receiver off the board is going to be that productive for you. So the fact that this is a super flex draft and the fact that Mac Jones is still on the board makes me be like, okay, I kind of got to take you to me. He's extremely similar to what we saw out of Joe Burrow last year. Like Joe Burrow came from Ohio state, kind of came out of nowhere, was not so great as a junior at LSU senior season. 60 touchdowns, won the national championship, had like the best offense we've ever seen. But then this guy, Mac Jones, comes out of nowhere and has another awesome offense, one of the better ones we've ever seen this year. And, you know, obviously he had Jalen Waddell and he had Henry Ruggs and he had Jerry Judy and he had Devonta Smith last year and they have Najee Harris out of the backfield. And he was pretty good when Tua went down. But then this year, like all he really had was Devonta Smith and Najee Harris. Jalen Waddell missed a whole bunch of games. He only played four, then he got injured and he came back towards the end. They had like, she loves Michi on the outside. They have a bunch of other guys. Like they had some tight end. I forgot his last name. I think he was number 89, but he was built like a tiny receiver. So I don't know how he was a tight end. Basically what I'm getting at is he had an extremely efficient and extremely productive year at the quarterback position, despite not being in the best situation in terms of weapons surrounding him. And when you compare his numbers to Joe Burrow, when it comes down to like yards per attempt, touchdown percentage, interception percentage, they're all extremely, extremely similar. The one difference is Mac Jones is not a running threat. Joe Burrow wasn't like the running threat that a Trevor Lawrence or Justin Fields is, but he definitely has legs and he's mobile. Mac Jones is a little bit more stagnant, but you know, he showed the arm talent. He showed the accuracy throughout the season. And I think if you can get a guy who's likely going to be a top 20, top 15 pick in the actual NFL draft with a legit path to touches. Like if he goes, not path to touches, but path to a job. If he goes to Washington, he's the best quarterback on the roster. If he goes to Carolina, he's the best quarterback on the roster. If he goes to San Francisco, he's the best quarterback on the roster. I wouldn't be surprised if he's somebody who is starting not only to start the season, but like even halfway through the season. And if you can get a starting quarterback in, you know, the early part of the second round in a super flex draft that has the type of pedigree that Mac Jones has, the chances of you returning value on that pick are probably really high. Instead of taking like the RB5 in this class or the wide receiver nine in this class or the tight end two in this class, just take like the quarterback six because even a guy like Dwayne Haskins, you could sell him for more than you probably acquired him for unless you were ridiculous and picked him at like the 103 in that draft. So um, although he's not like a sexy pick because he isn't a Konami code type of quarterback, I think the arm talent that he has will make him a decent enough quarterback too. like his ceiling could probably be a Kirk Cousins. And although that's not too high, like you'll pay a first round pick for Kirk Cousins if you don't have a quarterback in super flex leagues. So to get a 22, 23 year old Kirk Cousins, um, if that's his ceiling at this point in the draft, I think is pretty much a steal. Yeah, actually, that, that was a mistake. I mean, I totally forgot about Mac Jones. I should have actually taken him first. I mean, honestly, if Mac Jones wasn't top 15, you can't really let him follow the first round. So 
we probably have to squeeze him ahead of some of these wide receivers because the value and the and the flip value of him starting is too high. Um, I would absolutely take him ahead of a uh, ahead of a Deami Brown. You know, I'm just uh, you know I'm not really generally not excited about non Konami quarterbacks. That's why he's like falling a little bit lower for than me. But if he gets the draft capital, he will absolutely absolutely move up and uh, slide up in there. So yeah, I totally uh, missed on on that one, but it makes sense to get Mac Jones there. I think, you know, before we move on real quick, I think one thing I forgot to mention was one big mover in my in my ranks is is Jalen Waddle. So I think prior I didn't have him in my top top five wide receivers. I think he's pretty solidly in there right now. And it's gonna come counterintuitive because obviously I'm a numbers driven guy. Most of my analysis is like analytics driven, you know, whether they broke out, age driven. Uh well, Mike, say you've been watching film, say you've been yeah, watching yeah. in this in this scenario. Uh, I think I'm just going to make a contextual exception because even though Jalen Waddle technically didn't break out, he was smashing this year and he absolutely would have broke out this year. I think if he had, he stayed healthy uh, and he would have broke out like in a, in a pretty big way in his junior year, uh, you know, which is still a, a big red flag that he didn't took this long to break out. But if you look at his freshman year I and mean, people, will, a lot of people will probably compare him to Henry Ruggs, right? Cause neither of them uh, could break out. Both of them are really fast players. But I think, you know, one of the big differences here is one, Jalen Waddle will break, would have broken out this year, but two, Jalen Waddle like achieved in a freshman year, like 17% of the market share of receiving yards. And that's, that's like basically as high as Henry Ruggs ever gotten his entire career. So they're not really similar outside of speed. I find them to be not very similar players. The thing about Henry Ruggs too, is like coming out last year, like, Oh, he's extremely versatile. He can be returning punts and kicks. Like he never really did that. Jalen Waddle has done that. And Jalen Waddle has produced unlike Henry Ruggs. Yeah, and Jalen Waddle, you know, is just he's just way, way more like twitchy and and like way faster and able to like stop and go within short areas, you know, which means that he's going to be able to navigate tight spaces a lot better. And you know, I'm not some freaking you know wide receiver expert, but I think he's also a bit stronger off the line than someone uh, like a Henry Ruggs. He's got a, he's got a few more moves than a Henry Ruggs does because you know Henry Ruggs like I said a, a, the NFL cornerback puts his arms and puts his hands on him and his route is basically over it ends you not know there. how fast I am back up <laughs> please yeah. Back up. yeah whereas like Jalen Waddle actually has a couple moves so I'm a big fan of Jalen Waddle and I'm going to probably be a lot higher on him than than most analytical people will be he is in my top 5 wide receivers because one I think he, he's definitely going to get that draft capital but two you know you know numbers and all be damned I think he's just a really fucking good player so you know, based on my my very novice film grinder eyes, uh, I, I'm going to be pretty high on Jalen Waddle. I'm going to try and attack him and grab him late in the first in a couple of drafts, um, and and I might even I might even grab him ahead of like a a Deami Brown, for example, because I know draft capital will be there. So, uh, yeah, that's one thing I wanted to bring up. He he was a big riser for me because before I had him in the mid second, and right now he's definitely in the first round. Yeah, I think he's my wide receiver five behind Bateman, Chase, Devonta Smith, and then he might be right. It might be he's four for me. Him and like Bateman, him and uh, Rondell Moore are extremely close for me, just because I think they bring a lot of similar things to the table. Obviously, the analytical profile is there for Moore, but at the same time, like Jalen Waddle, it's kind of hard to have a young breakout age when you're surrounded by that many first round talents. And the fact that he was like consistent in his production, like his sophomore year, dipped a little bit. But his freshman year was awesome. Last this past year, he was awesome before injury. I just think that you know, watching him play and seeing the skill set he has, it's going to translate to the next level. He's going to get first or second round draft capital. I think it's going to translate to a good fantasy producer. Yeah, he could absolutely be the first wide receiver off the board, um, even without the NFL combine. People already know how freaking fast this kid is, and I, I have him ahead of Devonta Smith. So uh, that cool. there's a there's a hot take for you guys if you want one. All right, uh, who do you got the two hundred four, Mike? Uh, at the 204, so Mac Jones off the board. So normally here, I, I would go with my guy, uh, Seth Williams. Uh, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I've been a big fan of Seth Williams for a while, but recently I'm like, I'm like getting more and more concerned because like, it seems like nobody thinks he's going to get draft capital. He might be like a day three pick. And if he's a day three pick, uh, there's no way in hell I'm going to take him over like some of these other guys that might have more draft capital, you know, someone like a Terrace Marshall, someone like a uh, Amon Ross and Brown or something. I'm going to take him here so I can just kind of cover why I do like him. Uh, you know, he is that prototypical alpha receiver. Uh, he's got, he's got big ass size, uh, you know, but he's not refined. Right. And that's going to be the knock that everyone has on him is that he isn't very refined. You know, he's also a bit of a older prospect, even though he, he technically broke out in his, in his uh in his freshman year 
he was like already like 19 years old uh, or something like that. And then, you know, carrying over, he's going to be older than some of the other prospects, but he's huge, man. And, and the reason why he doesn't get much attention is because he does play with Bo Nix who freaking stinks. Like Bo Nix is, is just, is just bad. It's like, it's bad. He's, he's awful. It's kind of like, you know, similar situation to uh, Jalen Rager in terms of like, you know, the type of quarterback play that he was dealing with. But you know, what I've been learning more and more from speaking with some of the film folks out there is, you know, Seth Williams really struggles in the, which is surprising given his size because he's a, he's a beast, right? He is a towering, towering beast, but he does struggle uh, when faced with like physical press. Uh, so obviously, you know, that's a problem in, in the NFL. I don't care if you run like crisp routes, but if you kind of fold uh, when people get physical with you, a la Nikhil Harry, you're not really going to find that type of success. So I'm concerned with him, but my main concern still is draft capital. If he does get drafted, some of those concerns will be alleviated. Uh, before I firmly had him in my top five, but you know, after just considering uh, some of the stuff and just learning from some of the film side, I've kind of moved him down a, a little bit and I've, I've had Jill and Waddle and Diami Brown, both of them kind of leap ahead of him. Uh, so He's, he's kind of just falling a bit below, but I, I do still love the talent. And based on my novice little eyes, I do like what I see, man. Like he makes some incredible freaking catches, uh, like just catches that people shouldn't be making and pe people wouldn't make because that's how bad Bo Nix is. Seth Williams goes out there and, and makes some of those catches. So he's got a lot of weaknesses, he got a lot of holes and he's a developmental project, but he, if you're chasing the upside, man, I feel like Seth Williams is, is one of those guys that can absolutely hit on that upside. Yeah, he reminds me a lot of Mike Williams if Mike Williams wasn't perpetually surrounded by Randy Orton, Slytherin, giving him an RKO every time he catches the ball. He's like the same size. He has that vertical ability. And by vertical, I mean like jumping ability. Great hands. I know he has dropped a bunch of passes. Like that's another knock on him is his drop rate. But kind of like what I said with Jalen Rager last year, like if you can make a bunch, and I know it's not a great comparison after the rookie season he had, but if you make a bunch of contested catches and you bail at your quarterback as much as you do and you show the body control that you show in the red zone and deep down the field, like not so much that I'm not worried about the hands, but I think it's something that can be fixed. It's not like he has bad hands because he's making catches that, as you said, nobody should be able to make. And, you know, I haven't looked too, too deep into him being able to deal with physical press coverage. Obviously, if that is a knock against him, that's not going to be great because another thing he lacks in is yards after catch. He's not a great, like, he's not a burner or elusive in the open field, although he does try to, like, hurdle people every single time he catches the ball. So if he's not really getting off the press all too much and you can't really manufacture him touches because he can't gain yards after the catch, then that's definitely going to be a concern of mine for him. But like a Mike Williams, kind of like a younger Alshon Jeffrey, when you have that size and you have maybe that speed, I mean, we can't test it right now because the combine is probably not going to happen. And uh, maybe those like softwares that can tell me he runs 21 miles an hour make me a little more confident. But with that size and speed, if he becomes a little bit more physical and uses his frame to his advantage, I think not the the pinnacle like a Mike Evans has reached, but I think a very similar skill set where you're just a big guy who, although you don't run a four, four, you get open downfield because you know how to stack a cornerback, you know how to use your body and you know how to use leverage. Um, I think he can play that sort of role in the NFL, but if he can't get over physical press coverage and he's not the fastest guy in the world, then he's most likely going to dud out, especially if the draft capital is there and the coaching system does not, or the coaching staff doesn't want to give him multiple chances. Now, another guy, who is an absolute unit on the field. He has moved up my rankings a whole lot, my 205. Mike, do you know a man by the name of Ramondre Stevenson? Yeah. Yeah, Fucking he moved up in my rankings this too. guy. <laughs> Eddie Lacy 2.0, 6 feet tall, 246 pounds, but he looks like a goddamn ballerina out there. He made Trey Sermon move up north because he was so damn good coming out of Juco, going to Oklahoma. Now, there are some concerns, right? Number 1, he went to Juco. He didn't do too much his junior year because he was sharing a backfield. And then he broke out his senior year. I'm sure like senior year breakouts for running backs don't really fucking matter, but he's going to be a little bit older. He's going to be 23 years old as a rookie. And the other concern is he might be Elijah Holyfield. He might run a 4.7. He might run a 4.8. But if he runs anything like 4.65 or lower at that size, I do not care. This guy is so nimble. He is so quick for being that big. There's so many times you watch him like on the goal line, he gets absolutely smashed. And then he just like does a little twirl and falls into the end zone. He's going to be a goal line back. He's somebody who can catch the ball out of the backfield. And then just like looking at what he does, his in-depth numbers in terms of yards after contact per attempt, 3.9 ranked fourth in the class behind only Javante Williams, Khalil Herbert, and Jarrett Patterson. Jarrett Patterson plays at Buffalo. So he plays garbage ass schools. 
Um, J- uh, Khalil Harbert plays at Virginia Tech, I believe. So they play a little bit better competition. So does Javante Williams. He plays at UNC. And then beyond that, 33.7% broken tackle rate ranks only behind Javante Williams. So he's extremely slippery. He's extremely elusive. And you could say, oh, he falls into the mold of a Zach Moss, a guy who can play all three downs, is a fatter guy and isn't too fast. I think the difference is like, he uses his size. Like he's not afraid to run into somebody, truck him and keep going. He's not going to break off any 90 yard touchdown runs, but what he is going to do is slip through tackles, get the hard earned yards. If the draft cap draft capital is there at all, which I honestly don't know because he only had like one big year at Oklahoma in a weird season hampered by COVID where they played like six games, but he's averaging over a hundred uh, rushing yards a game and three receptions a game. If he gets day one or day two capital, Man, he's going to be hard to keep out of the first round. I just, I don't know. I love watching him play. And then I looked at his numbers when he was at Juco. Mike, in 11 games, this guy had 2,111 rushing yards, 9.5 yards a carry. And he was actually breaking off like 80-yard touchdown runs. I don't get it. Juco obviously doesn't have the same level of competition. But I think, you know, the skill set he brings to the table, as long as he is not a complete fat slug and like runs a five-second 40, I'm going to be all in on him. I am all in on the fat running backs in 2021. I like that. Uh, he moved up. I talked about him on the Mark Watch Mondays episode as well, and he's interesting because he does provide that three down skill set, and he's a he's a sneakily good receiver, uh, based on what I saw. And you know, he did kick Trey Sermon upstairs. It's gonna come down to draft capital. Like I have no idea where he's gonna get drafted. Like uh, what I what I fear is like this is one of those cases where like it's like a twitter darling like a twitter i love fantasy. him more than any 32 yeah. teams in the nfl do yeah like twitter like loves him like i don't want to be in another like tyler johnson scenario i think that's that's what scares me about him but like if they announce his name on day two we will be very very excited and he will definitely shoot up because as you said like he does not move like a guy that weighs in at 250 pounds uh he moves pretty pretty well uh for someone that size and you know, you have to move well from that size if you are going to be a receiver. And as we saw, like A.J. Dillon, not a receiver. So, you know, Ramondre Stevenson is definitely a huge, huge back, and he could actually – he could be pretty interesting. Uh, I, I like that pick. I think it's probably a bit too early for me. Just uh, there's a couple more guys on the board here. Um, you know, this is a zone where I tend to really favor uh, wide receivers over running backs because, like, the class is really deep, and we do have a lot more uh, good profiles to go through. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at, but I do like the pick. I mean, if I were to pick a, you know, running back, like, you know, he's definitely up there in consideration for me. So I'm going to move on here and I'm going to take, you know, there's a couple names that I like here, but I'm going to land on Amon Ross St. Brown. So Amon Ross St. Brown, wide receiver, USC, someone, you know, if you guys, the name sounds familiar, it's because his brother, Equinemius St. Brown plays for the Green Bay Packers. You wouldn't know it because he hasn't really done anything. Yeah, you use the word plays very loosely there, Mike. Yeah, yeah. But this is the brother, you know, the, there's a trio. Of, I think there's a trio of brothers. This is a trio of duo brothers. And obviously, Equinemia St. Brown is, is not the best one out of all of them. Amara St. Brown is. Uh, he broke out as a true freshman at USC, uh, continued to produce in his uh, sophomore year, and then, you know, went pretty ham this year on the TD side, which really helped his dominator. Uh, but if you look at his market share of receiving yards instead of the full dominator, which includes TDs, uh, it doesn't look as good, but he still has a pretty damn good uh, profile. So he's someone that I'm interested in here. I think getting him in the second round is could be a steal, right? He could be... He could be someone where we look back and we're like, damn, how the hell did he fall into the second round? Because he progressed really well. I mean, he broke out as a true freshman and, you know, with 26% of the team's receiving yards and then had a little bit of a flat year as a sophomore, 25%, and then shot back up to about 30% in this year. And, you know, he's someone that, you know, USC has provided some really, really good talent out of the wide receiver position, right? If you look back, you look at Robert Woods, you look at Juju Smith-Schuster, you know, Amon Ross Brown's got the size and the physicality to kind of play in the NFL. And I like his game, man. I like his game. I liked him last year more than I liked Michael Pittman. He was a big reason why I didn't like Michael Pittman as much because Amon Ross Brown was there handling the business. And with Michael Pittman gone, he kind of continued to just ball out. So, Big fan of Amon Austin Brown. I think he will get draft capital. So I'm not as concerned about draft capital for him. Um, I think he will go like somewhere in day two, probably in the second round, if I had to guess. And if he goes there, gets draft capital with his profile, with his skill set, I'm uh, pretty excited, man. I think he's someone that is actually pretty good with the ball in his hands. 
Yeah, he kind of birthed the egregiously titled YouTube highlight mixes. I remember last year, Nick and I were going through like the coldest receiver ever, the best receiver to ever play football in the history of football. Like his, I'm looking at it right now, his high school mixtape, most savage, all caps, high school wide receiver ever. Like chill out. Like he's a high school receiver. I can be that savage. But building off what you said, right, as a true freshman competing with Michael Pittman Jr. had eight less yards than him as a freshman. Sophomore year didn't progress as we'd like to see, but that year they were also feeding Michael Pittman Jr. like the ball every single play, and he was a senior. So obviously, if you have a guy who's like 6'5 and pretty fast in a not-so-great Pac-12, you're going to want to feed him the ball over a sophomore. Obviously, that's not like great in Amon Ross St. Brown's favor, that type of argument. But I do think the fact that this year he showed out in the touchdown department and not only being like a deep threat or not only being a yak guy, but also showing he can produce in the red zone – he had a four touchdown game where like all his plays were just like selling a slant, going to a fade, faking a fade, going for a slant. Like he's just, he's very polished is what I'd say. And being polished as a junior is a lot better than being polished as a senior. He's a little bit younger than what seniors would be obviously because he's a junior and just watching him play. It's like hard. I like to make that. Comps. Let me check that math on there. Junior yeah. Let me check the math. Junior, seniors. less than senior age. Okay. Checks out. So checks out. It checked out. And I like to throw out comps just to like help you guys know like what type of player they are. And it was kind of hard to think of one for him. He's like 6'1", 6 foot, 6 foot, 6'1", whatever, like 195 pounds. And it's not perfect, but I think a Jarvis Landry type of player is who I think he could be at the NFL. Mm. Somebody who is not the fastest out there, somebody who is not the best high at high pointing the ball, but is extremely efficient in their routes. They're not dancing at the line to get open. They're just quick off the line, very efficient, getting open, good hands, able to work after the catch, and just an overall really good receiver. So I like him as well. And I also think there's a chance like the Chargers take him because the Chargers do not leave like their vicinity when scouting players like they drafted fucking Joshua Kelly because he went to UCLA and they just brought in that dumbass DC who's probably gonna be good just to prove me wrong because he coached or he was the defense coordinator for the Rams. So he might go to the Chargers that might hurt him a little bit because he's like an extremely discounted Keenan Allen, but I like him as well. And Mike, I know you said there's a wealth of receivers at this point it's hard for me to pass on this next guy on the board. I know you want me to take Terrace Marshall. I know you want all these other guys. I'm going with Kenneth Gainwell because my comp for him is an Austin Eckler. But beyond that, right, as a redshirt freshman, and you said in Mark about Watch Mondays, he is the reason why Antonio Gibson wasn't a full-time running back. This guy was absolutely incredible. 2,000, 2,000 yards from scrimmage and 16 touchdowns sharing the field with Gibson. And obviously, if you're at Memphis, like I could go to Memphis and rush for 1600 yards, like their offensive system for the running back is ridiculous. And that's no slight on my skill set, because I'm a fucking great running back standing at like six, seven. But I do think that the skill set he brings to the table isn't one where if he's not drafted to be a starting running back, it's going to hamper him because he's a true pass catcher out of the backfield. Now, having a scat back go at the 206 or whatever we're at or 207 right now might not be the smartest decision but you know he's 5'10 195 pounds he's not the smallest guy in the world and I think kind of like a Tony Pollard is like one injury away from potentially being a lead back and if he gets the draft capital you know all it's going to take is a running back's contract running out or an injury for him to fully show that he can be a three down back obviously he didn't play this year and he only has one year of production but I think the fact that he can be used out of the backfield as a Swiss Army knife, both between the tackles, both as a receiving option in the NFL, moving more towards a system where, you know, you don't need to be a full on workhorse to produce in fantasy like an Austin Eckler, even when he was backing up Melvin Gordon was good for fantasy. I think what he brings to the table is somebody who has legit upside to catch like 50, 60 passes and also handle a good bulk of carries on the ground and turn in running back two seasons. And at this point in the draft, I think taking a guy like Kenneth Gainwell this year is a little bit more safe than drafting what we did last year in like a Keyshawn Vaughn, who is more of a one-dimensional type of guy. So although there are some good receivers on the board, I think the upside of a Gainwell with his breakaway ability and his dual threat skill set um, is where I lean at this point. Yeah, I, lo- I love that pick, by the way. I talked about Kenneth Gainwell, and you know he's a very interesting case because is he a good football player? If you have eyes, you can see that he is, right? And if you have brains, you could see that he is because he, he relegated really good football players to the bench. So I, I really like Kenneth Gamewell. My, my main concern, which I, which I aired before is like, I don't know like where he's going to land, right? Like if he lands in a place where he has a shot to lead a committee and to get work on the ground, I'm like super excited. Cause I think he's someone that's talented enough to do that. But if he lands in like a Tennessee Titans, kind of like a Darrington Evans did last year, I'm immediately not excited because I don't, I don't like PPR backs and he's small enough where like I could see a team pigeoning, pigeonholing him into like that type of role. But you know, he could like excel 
where he could excel is like kind of like start in that type of role, kind of like Austin Eckler did, but then also prove that he's a really, really good running back on the ground too. So uh, I'm excited Never to takes see him just so Melvin Gordon loses his job to another. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I hope, I think that'd be cool too. And I mean, there's a lot of, there's a couple of decent spots that he can go to. I'm, I'm really interested by, by Kenneth Gainwell, but uh, you know, having, having went there, you made my decision very, very easy. And, you know, I mentioned his name already, but it's going to be Terrace Marshall. Terrace Marshall is someone that I was actually interested in before this season. Um, you know, he was a very, very highly recruited prospect. And obviously it's, it's really hard to kind of produce when you're, when you're playing with the, the new rookie receiving yards holder in the NFL. Plus it, by my view, the tier one and by far and away the best wide receiver prospect of this class in Jamar chase and Justin Jefferson, but he, he wasn't a bum. Like he actually produced in the LSU offense, you know, he put up like 17% um, market share of receiving yards. And then this year, when the team took a dumpster fire, I mean, that LSU offense, you know, we asked like, oh, is it the, is it the offense? Is it the scheme? Is it the players? I mean, it turns out it's, it's freaking everything, right? But this year he broke out, you know, 20, put up 25% of Mark share of the receiving yards. But more importantly, I mean, he just looked freaking, he looked good, man. He looked good. He was lethal uh, in the red zone, catching TDs as well, 43% of the team's touchdown. So, Basically, I mean, almost half of the team's passing uh, touchdown scoring came through Terrace Marshall. And, you know, just looking at him play from a film perspective, he's a baller, man. I mean, he, he's, he's tall. He's, he's big enough to kind of play on the outside. Um, he's a little bit, uh, I guess, lanky, uh, I guess. Is that, is that the right word? Yeah, um, a gangly, yeah, he's, long arms. Yeah, he's, he's a little bit gangly. I mean, he's, he's tall. He's 6'3", 200. Like, not to, like, scout the helmet. But like from that perspective, it's kind of like like a DJ Chark in that sense, where like they're both really tall, lanky receivers, like that absolutely can threat you, threaten you downfield. Um, but I think he's someone that NFL teams are really gonna like, and I think he's someone that's gonna have pretty secure draft capital. So if you are drafting before the NFL draft, and you know, given we're not having NFL combines, I think he's a pretty interesting prospect. And I know some people that have him like very very high, like in their top five. So I think getting someone like a Terrace Marshall in the second round is is pretty exciting to someone like me yeah i was reading up on him he actually moved from like a 73 percent outside receiver last year to i think a 69 percent slot receiver this year so nice. kind of like just very nice kind of like justin jefferson went from outside to inside people are gonna say he's only a slot receiver because that's what he did this year despite last year being good on the outside to me when i watch him like it's it just seems like he's good at everything he's not at, like elite at any one thing he's not an elite route runner he doesn't have like any elite you know, yards after catchability. He's just really good at everything. Now I want to draw the comp to an Adam Thielen. That's just because like his size and his build and the fact that he can win both deep and over the middle, but obviously he's not the type of route runner that Thielen is. But if you just imagine the build that Thielen has and the hands that he has and how reliable he is as a receiver and the versatility he has in the inside and the outside, I think that's kind of a skill set he can bring to the table. Obviously producing at LSU and showing he can produce despite Joe Burrow being gone and Joe Brady going on will probably play well in NFL circles. He might fall to like the end of the first round or be picked end of the first round or second round just because of that. We played in the SEC and produced there. So I do like that pick. He's a little bit lower for, for me for like stupid reasons. I'm just like, when I watch him, like nothing stream, like pops off extremely off the tape. Whereas a guy like who I have above him, who I'm not going to pick right now, but like a Tylen Wallace, I think is just like a little bit more electric. So that's kind of how I make my ranking. So that's what you're listening to right now. Um, but I'm going to move on from another wide receiver to a running back at the 209. I got Trey Sermon. He is somebody who I'm like, eh, because I do think he could be a workhorse in the NFL given his size. But as you said, with a Ramondre Stevenson, as you said, with a Kenneth Gainwell, it all comes down to draft capital, all comes down to landing spot. Like he could land on, I'm not like, obviously like the Giants probably aren't going to take him or like the Panthers with CMC there, but like a team that has a legit starting running back. If he goes there, just throw him in the garbage because to me, like he's a good running back, right? He ranks pretty highly in like elusive rating and broken tackles. But when I watch him play, he just, he looks like Tim Duncan. He's like mad stiff out there. Like he's got a rod going up his back and like he just can't move laterally. He does run through people and he's got pretty good size at 6'1", 215. He can catch passes out of the backfield. But again, like nothing really pops off the tape when I watch him play. He did produce extremely well this year at Ohio State. Then again, he is playing at Ohio State, benefiting from playing with Justin Fields. 
And you look throughout his career, the quarterbacks he's played with are Baker Mayfield, Jalen Hurts, Kyler Murray, and Justin Fields, three of which are extremely mobile quarterbacks. So that probably could have helped him as well. So there are some red flags in the fact that, you know, he moves around like my grandpa and the fact that he has played in very good offensive systems. But then there's also a little bit of a saving grace in the fact that he's probably gonna have draft capital because he produced at Ohio State and he has the size and NFL coaches are like they look at the scale oh you're over 210 pounds I'm gonna throw you out there as my running back one so he does have that going for him again it all depends on draft capital and landing spot but if he lands on a team like the Seattle Seahawks and Chris Carson is gone I'm fine taking him here if he lands in like San Francisco or if he lands in Green Bay and they get rid of Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams I'll be like fine I'll take him but I'm not in love with the talent by any means I don't think he is anywhere near the best running back in this class. I think he's well within tier two, maybe even tier three, but the draft cap is there. The landing spots there. It's kind of hard to pass on him this late in the second round. Yeah. Tracer was interesting, right? Cause I mean, he's been in a committee the entire time. He, he like never really took over a backfield with the exception of like the small sample of a few weeks where he did look pretty damn good. And then he got hurt and didn't play the national championship game. So, but I mean, he was, he was a pretty highly sought after guy uh, before. And then people were, I know people were really excited about him transitioning over to OSU to kind of take over the roles. Uh, sorry, not take over the roles, but take over the reins and kind of go from there. But, you know, I'm, 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 I don't know about him, man. I don't know what to do with him. Like I'll take him ahead of like a Truba Hubbard. Cause like now that we're not having an NFL combine, like I'm not interested in Truba Hubbard anymore. Yeah. Everybody's going to uh, run the same 40s Truba Hubbard now. There's no upside. Yeah, exactly. So there's no upside to him, but you know, I'm not really jumping on him. I actually have a, another running back uh, ahead of Trey Sermon, uh, but I'm not going to go to running back. I'm going to go again, dip back into the wide receiver. Well, and there's a couple of choices here, uh, but I think what I'm going to do is go with, Tamari and Terry and love he's that. Someone, I almost put him on my list too. He's somebody who fell just short, like shy of the second round, but I love this guy. Yeah. He's a beast. I really would have liked to see him come out last year, but I understand why he went back. Like, I mean, we all know how bad Florida state is. I mean, it's a cam makers getting the draft capital and producing the way he did come out of that freaking cesspool is, is a miracle. Uh, but Tamari and Terry, I mean, he, he put up some baller numbers too, as a, uh, you know, the problem with him is like, he's a bit older, right? You know, he's going to be a 20, is he going to be 23 or 22? Yeah, 23. I looked at his age right before this. He's born in 98. Yeah, exactly. He's going to be a 23 year old, even though he only played uh, three years at Florida state. And he actually like basically opted out like midway through the season, I think, but he put up some monster, monster seasons there as a nine, as a 20 year old, 25% dominator. So that was his, his like freshman year, I guess. And then as a 21 year old red shirt, he put on a 36% market share of receiving yards. So he was an absolute monster producer at Florida State. And he's massive. He is huge, but he can freaking blaze. He is incredibly fast for his size. So that's what kind of makes him intriguing is not just not that he's fast, but he's incredibly fast and for his size. And I think that's interesting because he also produced. I mean, if he, if he was just big and fast and produce, I wouldn't be interested at all. Right. And but he is big and fast, but he also was quite productive. And the dude looks like a freaking baller, man. Like, I don't know how much how much tape you watch on Terry, but I remember when I was watching him last season, I was like, man, I really, really freaking hope this guy declares because I think he's going to be a freaking steal in the second round of rookie drafts. Unfortunately, he didn't declare. He went back for another year, but he is declaring now. So, and I think, you know, in the late second, I think that's absolutely worth a bullet to fire uh, for someone like him. If he gets a draft pedigree, I think he can go like, you know, somewhere in the late day two, which would make him pretty interesting. Yeah, he's like 6'4", 215. I honestly, obviously the combine isn't happening. I wouldn't have been surprised if he ran like a 4'4'0 flat. This guy yeah. absolutely burns. And it's not like he's only a deep threat. I know he was used there a lot, but there's t- like Twitter clips circling around where he catches the ball on the perimeter and just like cuts it upfield. Like his one cut ability for a guy that size and that straight line speed, you wouldn't expect that agility, but he's got it in spades. And, you know, it's it's kind of hard to say to fade somebody with his type of profile just because of what we've seen recently in DK Metcalf and in Chase Claypool. Like Chase Claypool's guy both of us did not like because his analytical profile wasn't there and I just wasn't convinced he was anything other than a tight end. Turns out when you're like 6'4", 230, you can run as fast as he does. Like teams will find a way to get you the ball. Tamari and, Tamari and Terry isn't built the same way. Like he's not as brolic as a Chase Claypool or a DK Metcalf, but the speed is definitely there. The size is there. The hands are there. Maybe he didn't really want to play for Florida State. I mean, I don't blame him. He opted out. 
And last year was a complete dumpster fire. But as a freshman, as you said, like he was a bit older, but he did produce. I think he was second on the team in receiving yards, but just slightly. But he led the team in touchdowns. And they haven't had like any sort of quarterback play since like DeAndre Francois thought he was a quarterback. And like before that, James Winston. So he has struggled a lot by playing in a terrible system. But beyond that, he's a size speed freak. We're not going to see it fully tested out, but I'm sure you can go on Twitter and see people say, oh, look, he ran 22.73 miles an hour on this play. That's really fucking fast for a guy his size. So I'm on board with that pick. Now, I think this is the 211, and I I could pick Kyle Trask. I would throw up my mouth if I did that, so I'm not going to pick Kyle Trask. I could pick Chuba Hubbard, but again, I would vomit again. So I'm going to go with his college teammate from Oklahoma State, my boy, Tylen Smoochie Wallace. This guy, I love him. I remember in 2019, I wrote about him as a potential top five wide receiver in the 2020 class. Then he tears his ACL in 2020 and redeclares for 2021. So he didn't come out as a junior. He's coming out as a senior. But I think, again, like when you put context behind it, the guy tore his ACL. He wanted to prove he still had it. He was maybe falling down draft court, draft boards because of that injury. But he's basically averaged over 100 yards, 100 receiving yards a game since his sophomore year, which is when he broke out. He had like 1,400 yards that year and he's an absolute menace obviously Oklahoma State produces elite receivers every single year because of that offensive system and the conference that they're in but just watching him play right he's somebody who wins deep down the field but beyond that he is somebody who breaks a whole lot of tackles in 2019 11 broken tackles on 53 receptions which may not seem like a lot but that's a 20.8 percent rate comparing that to the two wide receivers at LSU that year Chase was much higher at 27.4%, but Justin Jefferson was at 11.7%. So he's somewhere in between. He's a great yak receiver. He also has the size of like six foot or six one, 190 pounds. So if you can win deep down the field, if you can win after the catch, you're a decent enough route runner. And he has extremely good hands. Like he's mossing people week in and week out and only had one drop on 67 catchable targets. I mean, he's really polished. He's got it all there. I think the only downside to him is I guess twofold one he played in the big 12 and they don't really face all too many tough defenses and two he's coming out in his senior year but you know he's me 22 years old as a rookie it's not like he's a fossil and I think the skill set he has is one that you know the NFL is going to like my comp for him might be a little bit disrespectful to this guy given where he was coming out of college but I think like a modern day Sammy Watkins if he was healthy somebody who can win deep down the field and somebody who's physical at the catch point and pick up yards after the catch. I think that's what he can bring to the table in that in the NFL. He's not a Debo Samuel. He's not a Rondell Moore. He's not one of these guys who can be used out of the backfield as a gadget, but he's just, in my opinion, just a really sound overall, really good receiver. And for me, that's good enough for me to take him at the two eleven. And I think last year, if he was coming out um, as a junior in that class, he'd probably be a fringy top five wide receiver. So you're getting a discount by him going back for his senior year. Yeah, I love Tylen Wallace last year. Uh, I, I was sad that he didn't declare, but it made sense, right? Because he got hurt, and that's kind of what happened. He ended up he ended up getting hurt. He couldn't finish the season. I think he, he blew out his ACL or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so he went back to his senior season. And when he did go back, here's the thing, right? When, when you see players go back, they have to absolutely, like, just dominate and blow it out of the water. And that's, that's kind of what he did, right? He went back his senior year. Uh, went from 30% Mark Scherzer receiving yards to 40%. So he took that next step up. He went from 34% dominator to 30, 43% dominator. And like you said, in the sophomore season, when he broke out, it was not a normal breakout. It was a huge, huge breakout. I mean, 38% Mark Scherzer receiving yards uh, and 38% total dominator rating. So he was a, he was a great profile. And, you know, the concern is there, like you said, it's, it's Big 12. But you know who else came to Big 12? City Land, right? So sometimes there's good wide receivers do come out there. Uh, my concern with them probably just draft capital, man. I mean, like anytime someone goes back, that is, that is my, my concern. It's like the NFL, that that's a signal to me that the NFL said, yo, you're not good enough to get drafted uh, where you want to get drafted in like the early rounds. So, but if he gets drafted, you know, it's a lot more interesting. And I, I think that, you know, Tylen Wallace, Man, I and mean, we're not going to see him test either, but he, he's he got some pretty good athleticism. So, uh, you know, unlike some of the other wide receivers that we tied from the Big 12 last year, I can't remember their names, uh, but, you know, he, he's got the profile. You know, he's I think he's pretty athletic, and he's going to get some decent draft capital. So, you know, at the late second-round pick, you could definitely do worse at wide receiver. Yeah, I think so, I actually saw somewhere that he put up like a 40 inch vertical or like a 39 and a half. And the coaches were like, watch out when this guy tests, he's going to run a four, four and have a 40 inch vertical. Obviously if you're a coach of a guy, you're not going to say yeah, he's a 28 inch vertical and he runs a four, seven, you want to hype him up a bit. But like when you watch him play, he definitely has that in his bag where he can high point a ball and he can also burn defender. So yeah, if the combine was there, he probably would have been somebody that ranked or 
jumped up draft boards because of his performance in underwear. All right. So what is it? Is it the last pick last now pick. for me? Do it wisely, Mike. No, for everybody. It's at 212 right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. So 212. Um, look, th- th- there's an interesting decision to be made here. And you know, I think I'm, I think I'm going to go either with running back because I've been going wide receiver so heavy. I do want to kind of talk a little bit about one of these running backs and someone that I think could be a value that you're getting in the late second and early third. If you guys watch the market watch Monday, you probably know who it is. And it's Jamar Jefferson from Oregon. Uh, he's an interesting prospect. I mean, he, he like as a freshman balled, he balled as a freshman. And then, you know, people kind of forgot about him in his sophomore year, and he came back this year and kind of just like picked up where right where he left off. You're not going to see it in the counting stats because they only played uh, he only played six games this year, right? Compared to his freshman year where he scored where he played like 12 games. But in those six games, he looked electric. Uh, he had you know he is a capable receiver as well, which is something I look for. And then he's got the size, man. He's like 5'10", 215, 220 pounds, so he can kind of carry that workload depending on where he lands. It's, it's really just going to come down to, you know, like we always say, like draft capital. And for the running backs in this in this in this area, chances are you're probably not going to have day two draft capital. Right? You're looking at guys who are getting day three draft capital. Hopefully they get drafted in like the fourth round and they're going to go into a committee, maybe even like a backup role, but potentially can work their way up. You know, something like a Tony Pollard, for example. Right. Someone I was interested in when he got drafted there. Uh, I don't know if you if you've watched any Jamar Jefferson, no, uh, but I, maybe I, like one highlight reel. I'm like, I'm not getting too much out of a highlight reel. Maybe I should watch the tape. And then I'm like, I'm not going to watch tape of Jamar Jefferson. So I, <laughs> I haven't looked too deep into him yet. Yeah. So he's, he's an interesting prospect. I think you guys should take a look at him. Uh, you know, I'm taking him here ahead of Truba Hubbard, which is, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's a little bit too hot takey, but you know, like I said, Tr- Truba Hubbard, the one thing he had going from is that track speed. And if he doesn't get to put on full display in the national stage, uh, at an NFL combine and given how, how, how bad of a year he had, I'm just not so sure where he goes in the draft. And, you know, my comp for Trooper Hubbard is Tevin Coleman. And if you guys know anything about me, I've never wanted Tevin Coleman in any team, any year ever. I've never wanted him. And I've always said to fade him because he's just not very good. Um, I think the only person that's ever wanted him is Kyle Shanahan. And even he yeah. doesn't really want him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kyle Shanahan tried to want him, tried to play him. Didn't work out because he wasn't that good. So, uh, I think Jamar Jefferson is an interesting prospect, you know, and then a lot of like some of the film guys I respect, they're pretty high on him as well, which gives me a little bit of comfort there. Uh, but you know, at this stage, you're kind of throwing, like you're kind of throwing those darts, right? When you get to late second, you know, when, when people say a class is deep, we're not talking like, you know, third round, fourth round deep. We're talking like, you know, it goes well into the second round and kind of here is you're kind of just going for whoever it is that you kind of like. And it's good for me. It's between Jamar Jefferson. If I hadn't taken him, if I hadn't gone in this wide receiver drafting spree, like I did, you know, I probably would consider someone like an Elijah Moore who actually has a really, really top end analytical profile wide receiver plays for Ole Miss uh, probably will be like more so in that slot role. He is a bit on the smaller side. Um, I think he's like, maybe he's like, five, nine, 185. So he's like kind of big, but he's also small at the same time. Yeah. He's, he's maybe a little bit thicker, but he's a little bit tiny. So um you know, he's another interesting prospect, really, really great analytical profile, but you know, well, from what I've learned in the past, you can't just rely on analytics and I'm not, I haven't really seen too much positives from, from the film community in terms of like what he does and puts out, puts out on film. But if you look at the just pure numbers, he broke out huge uh, as a 19 year old, 38.4% mark share of receiving yards. And then this year across a 40% mark, which is very, very high end. And then on the dominator side, similarly as well. So he's an interesting prospect. And I think he's someone that will, I'll be looking to target in the early third, like late second round range. So those are the two players that I'm kind of looking for in that range. Yeah. And Lane Kiffin was at Ole Miss this year. And like, he just draws up every play for a small guy to score a touchdown. So he did benefit heavily off of that. He's somebody who was on my top 12 list in the second round that didn't end up making it. There was two other guys like Chuba Hubbard, as you said, he reminds you of Tevin Coleman. He reminds me of like Philip Lindsay, like he's extremely fast, but you got to get him the hole and you got to get him to hit the hole for him to have any sort of production. He did catch a lot of passes early in his career, but he is not a pass catcher in any sense of the imagination. Another guy was Kyle Trask. Again, he's like a very discounted version of Mac Jones. He's not going to run the ball for you at all. But unlike Mac Jones, I feel like he doesn't have the same arm as him. He kind of got exposed in their bowl game. I know Kyle Pitts wasn't playing. I'm not sure if Kadarius Toney was playing either. But when you get exposed like that, that definitely doesn't help your draft stock. If he falls like the second round, chalk him up as like Drew Lock 2.0 without the arm. 
Um, he's like what Philip Rivers is right now. Sure, he could be like the quarterback 24 in a season, but nobody's really biting at the quarterback 24 in a season. And then a few other guys, like I don't really look into tight ends too much because I don't necessarily want to draft them, but like Pat Freyermuth or Fryermuth, however you pronounce it, and like Brevin Jordan, they're supposed to be good. I don't know much about them. If you want to look into them, go at it. I'm pretty sure like people on Twitter or on YouTube are posting it. Not to say that we won't cover them, but right now I don't know too much about them. Brevin Jordan went to Miami, so he's probably going to produce because every Miami tight end produces. And Pat F, because I don't know how to pronounce his last name, went to Penn State, and we saw what Mike Gesicki can do. He catches the ball and falls down, so maybe he'll be much of the same. A few other names, uh, Jarrett Patterson out of Buffalo had like that eight touchdown game. I'm pretty sure he's like a jag. Like he's just a smaller guy, like a small, thick guy that doesn't pop off the tape. And one guy I kind of liked watching on film was Khalil Herbert. Uh, he transferred from, I believe, Kansas to Virginia Tech this year. Nothing crazy. No numbers were crazy, but I just watching him play. I know this is like lame to say, but I'm like, oh, he looked like he had good bursts. So uh, take that for what it is. I think he's a decent enough player that if he gets like day two capital, which I doubt he will. Day two capital, I'll probably move him you know, high third round, but as it is right now, he's just like a speculative, speculative, like fourth round pick as it stands. But that's like all the guys that I had in contention for the second round for me. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, that kind of wraps it up. Um, do you want to just repeat for the listeners out there who the, who the 12 were? I, I don't necessarily remember the order, but I know we went Rondell Moore first. I think Diami Brown second, Mac Jones third. Uh, I forgot who you went. I think Seth Williams, then Ramondre Stevenson, I, I forget after that. I think there, there will be timestamps in the description. So if you want to check them out, then you can find out the order. But I went through like five off the top of my head, which I think is pretty impressive for a kid that can barely count to seven. Yeah, I think it was like Ramondre, Stevenson. After that, I went uh, Amon Ra, St. Brown. Mm -hmm. right? I went Gainwell. And, and then you went Gainwell. And then I went Terrace Marshall. And then you went Sermon. Uh, maybe. Sermon. And then I went, uh, who is it? Tamari and Terry. And then you Tyler. went Tyler, Ty, Tyler Wallace. And then I wrapped it up with Jamar Jefferson slash Elijah Moore. So there you have it. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you did enjoy, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Helps us more than you know. Make sure you hit the thumbs up to help us counter the thumbs down Autobot trolls uh, that kind of hit the channel. And then, uh, you know, we'll be back at you again. You know, we'll kind of like, I think, you know, now that the NFL combine isn't really happening, we probably won't do like, uh, a mock draft update specifically for that maybe we'll just do like an update a couple months from now just to see if like opinions change and then we'll kind of like do a same update after the draft uh so we know where, pe where people have landed uh, and kind of give you an update there on the first two rounds but you know just stick around man i mean i think Noah and i uh are gonna start working on some like individual profile videos similar to what we did last year and update those uh, upload those to the channel i think those you know were help, pretty helpful, uh, even for me to do, but also I think the viewers kind of enjoyed it, so we'll be sure to put those out. Um, My favorite part, too, is we did the Antonio Gibson one, and the thumbnail was like, is Antonio Gibson the next David Johnson? And people, you'll see a comment, it's like seven months ago, what, are you crazy? Didn't do anything. And there's a comment <laughs> like two weeks ago, this guy's awesome. I can't believe you called this. Like, it just shows that, like, the progression of people's takes throughout the offseason. Yeah, it's pretty jokes. And, you know, I, I mean, a lot of those videos, I mean, you know, we definitely had uh, our misses for sure, but, you know, we had, like, the Cam makers uh call in there we have like the jk dobbins it's, it's pretty interesting because you know no will give you that insight onto the film grinding side and then i'll try and give you a little bit of insight on the member side and then we kind of collide and see uh, where we have them both and you know typically the best the best hits that we've had uh so far are ones where like Noah likes the film and I like the analytics, uh, you know, with the exception of Jalen Rager, that is <laughs> so peace out to him. But <laughs> other than that, uh that's all we got for you guys. Make sure you tune in again next week for another episode.